All right, thank you very much. Uh, last technical talk uh, of the conference. I know you guys are exhausted, but I would need a little bit more attention from you just for the next 20 minutes. And I would like to start with three questions. First question, uh, raise your hand, please, if you know Jason. Okay, all of you, good. Then please raise your hand if you know math. Not scientific math, just math, simple math. You know, it's just like, okay. Then, third question. In the next slide, I will show you a JSON uh, file which contains my name and my birthday. And I would like you, after I count to three, to tell me how old I am. Okay? M make sense? Good. So, three, two, one. Nobody? Okay, let me help you. Now, three, two, one. 36, thank you very much. All right. So, my name is Maxim Zaks. I'm a recovering um, game developer, and I would like to talk uh, uh, to you about JSON and why are we using JSON. Like, those are the three buzzwords which I will uh, kind of talk about in my session. It's size, efficiency, and random value access. So this is a quite cheesy joke, right? So kind of like I showed you like the binary and expected that you can actually see and understand it. But um, for me, it drives one point. Uh, human readable is a lie. Because what makes JSON human readable is the text editor. And that's the thing, every developer has a text editor, every machine has a text editor. So if we encode something in a textual representation, then it's kind of human readable because we have the tools to make it human readable and writable. But in reality, for the machine, this is how it looks like. This is the whole representation. And this is completely non-human readable. And if you think about it, also this text here, not really human readable. It's human re uh, readable because uh, it is a very simple example. But as you can see, this one is not formatted. This JSON is minified. So if I will present you an example which is more a uh, real life example, like for example here, this is a result from the Giphy.com if I will ask for 25 trending GIFs. And as you can see here, scrolling-wise, it's huge. And this is not human-readable anymore. The funny fact is, even Visual Studio Code couldn't do the semantic highlighting here. It just gave up. Even though it's understood, it's JSON. So to make this actually human-readable, we have to format it. Now it's much nicer, right? It's name, birthday, year, month, day, everything is human readable. We can actually understand it quite well. But this means we just bloated up the binary representation. We added lots of noise just to make it human readable. But this is as well why we use JSON, right? Because it's human readable in a way. So here we are kind of in a clinch with uh, ourselves. Uh, so basically, if, we, uh, if you look at this, the minified JSON is 65 bytes and the formatted JSON is 81. And if I present the uh, real life example, this is in kilobytes. Uh, so I have here 113 kilobytes and the formatted would be almost 180 kilobytes. So 1.5 more data, which we would um, get back if it would be really human readable. Now, um, generally raise your hand if you can, if you make sure that the data that communicates from your servers to server or server to client is always minified. How do you ensure that? There is no way to ensure it. The only way how you could ensure it is to say like, okay, up to a certain size of the payload, we won't accept it because I can send you this small object which contains name and birthday in gigabytes of data. I will just fill it up with 
just basically empty space. And it will be still a valid JSON. Your parser will parse it. It will take forever, but still it will parse it. So can we do better? And normally, if you think about it, like what is the core thing that we try to communicate with this JSON? It's basically this, date and the name. Date is eight characters. Name is 10 characters, so 18 bytes in total. If you see, actually, I didn't even introduce any um, um, delimiter here, because I know if the dates are represented, you can always represent a date in eight uh, characters. Therefore, I know eight characters is the date, and then everything there will be the name. So uh, there is no need to actually kind of uh, introduce a comma or empty space, and so on and so forth. And in this case, you see, like, OK, formatted JSON 81, minified JSON 65, and mm, custom text is 18, which is a huge difference, right? Now, can we do better? What do you think? Yes. And actually, what we can do is just, um, just to say, like, OK, 1981 is a number. And we were uh, represented as text as four characters. But in reality, as it is a number, we can represent it as a, uh, an int with two bytes. And therefore, we can go to 14 bytes, right? which is a 25% off, which is interesting. Now, custom binary serialization, ain't nobody has time for that, right? So it's kind of like nobody does it. Like, the only people I know, like, I haven't been to all the industries in computer science, so maybe I'm missing something. But uh, one of the industries which still kind of use custom uh, binary serialization is gaming industry. And only if it's like real time multi. Uh, Massive multiplayer things, then you need to have your packages really small, and you need to use UDP, and so on and so forth. All the other people don't really use this kind of stuff, because they don't have to, because they are, there are lots of problems which you can get into if you use custom serialization uh, 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 stuff. But if you Google or go to Wikipedia, and just search for uh, serialization formats. You don't have to uh, be able to read this. I just wanted to show, like, Wikipedia has, like, over 40 different formats listed, which make serialization possible. JSON is also there, but it's only one of the fo uh, over 40 formats. Uh, but also, uh, disclaimer, I looked through the list, and uh, in some cases, the information is not that uh, accurate. But at least you have a big list of everything that you can uh, find and try to realize what kind of things could uh, fit your needs, actually. So I um, have a different talk uh, on where I explain in details how the... Um, uh, those two binary serialization works. So if you would like to uh, f uh, follow up, this is the link. But here I just wanted to show that... Um, uh, sh raise your hand, please, if you know flat buffers. Okay, just four people. Uh, raise your ha uh, hand if you know protobuf. Much more people, sure. Anyone knows Colfer? Nobody knows Colfer. So, uh, <laughs> so just basically, like those are free serialization formats, and Colfer is based on protobuf. It's, it's just simplified, and there were a few edges cut it. So it's not as powerful as protobuf, but it's much faster than protobuf in serialization and deserialization. If you are interested in just uh, um, Google for it, and you will find it, or uh, um, come talk to me. But what I wanted to show is basically that if you do it in a binary format, you can get close to what we saw with the custom representation. And the good part is, in this format, we will keep the structure. Uh, all these formats are uh, schema-based, and you define the schema, so you tell that you have a name, you have a birthday, which is uh, its own type, and this type have a year, month, and day, so it's not really custom or uh, so proven to break 
really easily, but it still gives you the possibility to reduce the size dramatically. Okay, now let's talk about performance. Um, JSON is a text-based format. And to be honest, I don't have problem with JSON. I like JSON. JSON as a, a representation is, in my opinion, pretty good. I really like it, specifically compared to uh, XML or whatever. But the problem is basically text-based format, right? So text-based format would be very efficient if we have something like this. So we have a person here which types text into a computer. This computer will just send the text without understanding it to another computer. This computer will just display the text to another person. This person reads it, uh, replies to it, and then it goes back without the computer's need, uh, need to actually understand what's inside there. It's just blobs, moving blobs, perfectly fine. But in reality, we have this situation. Like the previous situation, I think in the beginning of the internet, it kind of was like this. So people sat on a terminal, just uh, punched in some text and just sent it, and some other actually read this. Now we have services talking to each other, right? No humans. But what we actually do is still the application has its state encoded in 0 and 1s and so on and so forth. So what we make it do to please transform it to human readable, we will send this human readable over the internet to another computer. It will be still human readable. This computer doesn't know how to read this human readable, so it has to parse it, and then it will actually get into, again, zero and ones format which it can understand. I don't know about you guys, but if I see this, I feel like this. I actually just want to kick myself because it just doesn't make any sense in a way. And well, I'm exaggerating a little bit, right? Because if you think about it, you can have different platforms. The binary on this side is, can be different on this side because you have different programming languages and so on and so forth. But this is what the binary serialization formats are for. They are here to make a platform independent binary representation which can be easily read by machines, from machine to machine, server, um, service to service. And what we actually just can do is this. We can just say like, okay, and let's put a binary, uh, boundary here um, to say when the services talk to each other, when the machines talk to each other, it's in binary to binary. If I as a human and generally, I see the point of human readability and even writability. Uh, in the beginning, it's even more important because I want to try out stuff. I want to do something. And it's much easier for me to write it in a way which I can uh, just use a text editor for than to try to do it in binary, right? But then at some point, I'm done debugging. And most of the binary serialization formats as well have a possibility to transform JSON into this binary per script and from binary into JSON again. So we have still this way if we need to read this, if we need to write it, there is a way. But we, we're not enforcing the text format onto machines, like the format that, that they actually can't read to them to say, like, read this, parse this, create this. And if you don't do this, it actually pays uh, off quite a lot. So uh, as I said, I'm a recovering uh, <laughs> game developer. And in my last gaming project, I, um, we had a problem with JSON. Uh, so we had a way for um, context startup where um, it took like 60 milliseconds for, uh, for switching context on the backend because most of the time was uh, spent on parsing JSON. When we switched from JSON to flat buffers, we went to 2 milliseconds. So it was like 30x down. 
And it was fair, uh, and we didn't measure just for parsing. We actually measured like the bringing it up for context, removing the context, um, switching from context to context. Um, I ported flat buffers to Swift and also flag, uh, flex buffers. And this is what my micro benchmark shows. If you do like a, a, um, comparing JSON uh, serialization and um, deserialization to flat buffers and flex buffers. So here we see that, for example, decoding here, it's 3,000 milliseconds almost 4,000, so four seconds. If you do it in uh, flat buffers, it's 18 milliseconds. So it's like 250x. The funny thing is, I can actually bring this number to four milliseconds if I remove some safety checks. If I would use a C implementation of flat buffers, I would go to two, making this a 2,000 uh, gap. In a way. Okay, one more last thing. Um, zero cost random value access. Uh, this is uh, generally a buzzword, and if you s hear zero, uh, zero cost, this can be right, because there is no zero cost anyways. But what it means in cases of binary serialization is basically that there are a few binary uh, formats I know only this three, flat buffers, flex buffers, and Captain Proto, which let you get values out of a binary without uh, creating any kind of representation. You basically kind of have something like jumping in the memory, so get a few, uh, doing some uh, dereferencing, and then you can read the value out because the formats are already designed in a way that it's memory aligned and uh, basically everything is reference based. So uh, this lets me do following. So I saw that on this conference there is lots of uh, talks about search, and I have also a search example made with flat buffers where I have a data set with all uh, uh, city names. It's more than 3 million entries, which is roughly 150 megabytes as CSV. I transform it uh, to flat buffers, and then I can do offline search on my iPhone for um, um, country name and city name. And uh, this I can also do either if I load everything directly into memory or directly from file. Because the data is laid out already in the way that you can just uh, seek inside of a file and read only portions of the data, not all of the 150 megabytes. So here's the demo. So I, uh, um, here's the memory reader. As you can see, I have 3 million cities, and I can scroll without any problem. I will now search for cities in Germany. So there are like 70,000 entrances. You see the, uh, 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 the speed of the query. Now I will search for Berlin. Again, the um, query speed is actually quite good. Right, there was one point where it was like two milliseconds or four milliseconds or something like this. Everything else is actually beyond uh, uh, one millisecond. And here, I do the same directly from file. Again, slower, like 30 milliseconds uh, in worst case scenario, but still very, very fast. And I'm able to do it because the format already uh, represents the data in this uh, zero-cost um, random access way. All right, so general lookout. So please don't use JSON just because it's convenient or because everyone, know, everyone else uses it and so on and so forth. Please consider your use case. There are use cases where it's totally fine to use JSON or even performant to use JSON. I don't know, maybe. But what I normally see is basically uh, it becomes like the one thing uh, fits all. I can represent this stuff in JSON. Great. Let's represent it in JSON. Human readable is a manner of tooling. As I showed in the beginning of a presentation, text representation, we already have all the tooling we need. 
If it's a little bit different, then yeah, there can be a tool or you would need to write a tool or, or something like this. But still, it's very easy if it's uh, machine readable, it's, you just need to have a tool which will make it human readable. And normally it's not that hard to do these kind of things. <sighs> Imagine how much more responses our service could deliver if it took 200 x less time to process a request. Because literally, if you think about it, the web servers, most of the time what the endpoint do, they get requests, the payload is JSON, they parse them, they identify what to do, and then they start doing this. And this is the main load which we have on our servers anyway. If we could reduce this, this is what we also did, why we uh, switched from JSON to uh, flat buffers in my previous uh, 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 project, because the backend developers um, uh, um, told we would like to have 100 users per second per core. If you waste 60 milliseconds on parsing JSON, we are already at 12 uh, users per second per core doing nothing. Yeah, and I'm actually open for questions. All right, let's thanks, Ma Maxime. <laughs> There's one in the center. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. So thank you for the talk. Very cool. Uh, have you um, used maybe other ones like Abro and Creef and other binary uh, protocols? And you can have any tips about it for sure. Ones have trade-offs between the others, but maybe you have more mm -hmm. more examples and tips about. Yeah. So them. so again, I have a very deep understanding of flat buffers and flat buffers because I ported them. Right. I looked into Colfer and a little bit of a protobuf because I was interested because I saw there is a, a, a GitHub repository which um, have a benchmark for uh, different uh, serialization formats on GVM. And there, Colfo was the fastest, even faster than uh, flat buffers in decoding, which then I went through the test, and actually test does something wrong because uh, they didn't consider this uh, random access. Because basically, what they did, they already um, kind of got the binary uh, and still mapped everything from this representation into a uh, Java object graph, which you don't have to do anymore in flat buffers and in Captain Proto as well. Thrift, for example, uh, by Facebook and also Protobuf by Google, they are um, generally designed for machine-to-machine -machine communication. So for RPC sending messages. Therefore, what they're trying to do is to uh, actually do bit, uh, bit packing. Flat buffers is on contrary designed to store data and be able to read this data. So for example, it also was done by Google in their uh, um, game developer initiative. And what you do there is you would like to uh, store uh, game state, for example. And there you would like to be very efficiently read data out of it. This is why it uh, supports this um, zero, zero cost random access values, right? So uh, this is the trade-off which you have to uh, think about and see. And like, if you are only about sending messages to each other, then I would look uh, into uh, protobuf, thrift. There were a few more uh, forms. There is plenty, right? Um, but for example, also in this uh, GIFI example, as you saw, I only asked for 25, I need just 25 URLs. They sent me 170 kilobytes of response because it, it has everything. And there it's actually m nice to have this uh, like zero cost random access because then I will just be able to just randomly access with right URLs which I need and I'm done. I don't have to 
create objects for the whole payload and so on and so forth. Make sense? Okay. Uh, so I like the topic because it's like ad addresses the more of a fundamental level of the question, why do we transfer the text over machine-to-machine uh, -machine co co uh, communication? And, and my mm -hmm. question is more uh, towards uh, kind of discussion kind of topic, uh, not very specific like a uh, question directed to you specifically. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, when basically when I was digging into the same question, why machines-to-machines communication use text, the, I found the answer basically an HTTP. So HTTP was basically designed to have uh, hypertext transfer protocol, right? So it, because of text. So yep. when HTTP came into existence, uh, it basically was um, person will request the document to some computer and it will, he will get the like website over there. That's why mm -hmm. HTTP was designed. Mm -hmm. And now uh, when I see the things are evolving towards protobuf and machine to machine communication and everything is binary, and uh, so like my kind of question kind of thing is like uh, do you think it's probably the time when basically when machine to machine communication is increasing mm -hmm. it's time to move away from http and have some kind of other kind of protocol which is machine to machine protocol mm -hmm. and text transfer protocol is for text mm -hmm. uh, basically json is for text because it's like getting transferred as a text and it was uh, for text in the beginning of time. Yeah. So, uh, and you can see, for example, HTTP2 is more of a binary protocol than a text protocol. They're already moving with HTTP2 into a more binary space. You also can see, for example, gRPC from Google, uh, which is like uh, Google RPC stuff, you, uh, is also more binary and it lets you. Uh, the payload can be binary, they don't care. This is actually funny because if you think about it, even with HTTP, with the standard uh, web stuff, hmm. HTML is text, right? Hmm. How many things in this text is actual text which humans will read and how many things in this text is actually for machines to read, right? For example, CSS. Why isn't CSS pre-compiled to binary and sent over? Because it no human will read CSS, right? But it's still in text because it's easier just to just basically like send it over. The only thing which we do is minifying stuff and sometimes gzipping stuff, right? And there, but it's kind of like, in my opinion, it's basically the patch on a wound where we say, actually, it shouldn't be text in the first place. Then we wouldn't need to encode it in the first place. Because encoding, again, it goes again efficiency. Yeah, for example. All right, let's wrap up. Okay. Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. <laughs>